And the topic is the open graphics stack. Alyssa is a software developer and software freedom activist known for developing the free Panfrost drivers for the Mali GPU and reverse engineering the Apple M1 GPU. Outside of computing, she studies mathematics at the University of Toronto. I'm uh, very happy to be here. And uh, when we talked about the open graphics stack, and specifically on uh, 3D rendering, which is uh, what I've specialized in, and so uh, GPUs. And so overall, the goal for this talk is just to understand uh, how the 3D rendering works on Linux, uh, all the different layers of abstraction involved. And as you will see, there are a lot of them. In a nutshell, the stack is just turtles all the way down. I was going to have a lot more on the slide, but uh, Throughout this talk, I guess we will go through all the different uh, uh, turtles on that stack. So at the top, at the very top of the stack, you're going to have uh, whatever the application is using the uh, actually using the GPU trying to do some 3D rendering. So for team open source, that's going to be a lot of our open source games. Uh, I'm personally a big fan of Super Tux Kart, <laughs> um, and Underneath those games are going to be the game engines, which uh, are what's actually driving the uh, the hardware to, uh, via the driver. Uh, so already, just within the context of a single game, you have uh, two layers, one being the high level, uh, just the game logic, and the below it, the uh, lower level graphics management. Uh, project. And Mesa is a library that is uh, situated in user space, not in kernel space, but implements the hardware drivers. And this is a, already uh, a, another peculiarity of the 3D rendering stack on Linux, is that the bulk of driver code for a GPU is running in user space, uh, not in kernel space. Uh, if Linux were a microkernel, you would expect this, but it's not. This is just that's how we do it. And uh, the reason for this is twofold. One is performance, uh, because this involves, uh, uh, this reduces the number of system calls required uh, for every single frame and every draw. And two is security. It dramatically reduces the attack surface if the complicated part of the driver can happen in Mesa in user space instead of in the kernel. So what is in this massive Mesa project? Well, and you have two big pieces. One is implementing uh, whatever application programming interface uh, is being used for the, game, for the uh, game engine. And the other is implementing the compiler to take in the shaders, so the uh, little graphics programs running on the GPU uh, from some high level source language that the uh, application gave it in and compiling it down to a hardware specific uh, machine code. So that's the very high level. And then in between that, uh, there is a lot amount of common infrastructure. On one hand, you have common infrastructure for uh, Gallium for the OpenGL drivers and for Vulkan. Uh, you have a common NER compiler, which is used uh, for most of Mesa's compiles. I'll get to that later. And of course, you have all of the different drivers and all of the different compilers. So Mesa is this point is uh, frankly massive. You have um, every, I don't want to say every, but every vendor who matters has a giant pile of code in Mesa to drive their hardware. And so this is sort of where all the magic is happening. Uh, but of course, you, user space can't talk to a hardware by itself. And so that's where the kernel comes in. So Linux itself uh, has drivers for every piece of hardware. And this is with the DRM uh, rendering stack. And this is the good kind, don't worry. <laughs> um, although you could have. That. And so the, the layering here is just that the Linux driver provides a very thin uh, layer above the hardware, something that's very simple. So it's very fast and with very little attack surface for the security side, but provides enough functionality to let user space uh, do all the real work. 
And so overall, you get a stack that looks something like this admittedly complicated looking flowchart going from your application to your engine through some API uh, to have the compiler and the commands to the hardware. And those are going to go through the whole compiler stack and also go through the whole driver stack uh, down to the hardware. So that's the big picture. Or if you like the linear form, the bird's eye view is going to have uh, these seven different layers to it uh, just going down the stack. And uh, for the next big chunk of the talk, uh, I would like to talk about uh, the, speci the specifics of each of these layers of abstraction, uh, what each layer sees when you're trying to do some particular rendering task. And this, I hope, will elucidate uh, how they fit together and also why there are so many. <laughs> and it's true. This is there is a lot of layers to this. It um, most hardware does not require such complicated stacks. Usually, um, it's just going straight from a user space application to the kernel to the hardware. Um, graphics, as we'll see, is very special, and the um, in that it has executable uh, shader functionality which requires the compiler and requires much more complicated APIs and requires engines to drive in and all that fun stuff. So without further ado, let's look at the bird's eye from the top down. The application layer, uh, this is as cl clear cut as you can make it. For a game that's just drawing something with some high level description for a desktop, and yes, most of your desktops, uh, even on Linux, are going to be 3D rendered at this point. Uh, whether you use X11 or Wayland, uh, chances are that's all going through uh, OpenGL. And so it's just looking at the layer of compositing different windows on your screen. And or again, a browser. You don't think of a browser as a 3D rendering application. Uh, and, I don't, and I don't mean, oh, well, it's material design, so it's 2D. <laughs> but uh, that's all going through the GPU for uh, modern browsers as well. So it's just seeing the level of rendering some piece of HTML and CSS. Uh, of course, your hardware doesn't know anything about 3D models or, or Windows services or CSS rendering. Uh, that's going to be the job of the graphics engine. So the graphics engine is taking in that higher level representation and going to uh, convert it into something that one of the uh, graphics APIs allows. So OpenGL is the dominant API that's going to be used on Linux. Uh, Vulkan is the new kid on the corner, and we'll talk about it in a bit. But the idea is the same. Uh, instead of thinking about these high-level rendering concepts, you're thinking about uh, just drawing triangles. Uh, you're thinking about these shaders, these little programs running on the hardware, the graphics hardware, uh, to decide a what uh, what triangles to draw and where to draw them that's going to be the vertex shader and, and that's the pixel shader and already this is a huge uh, jump down in abstraction from the application layer uh, because when we think about 3d rendering or uh, desktops or browsers you're not thinking about triangles and shaders um, but this is how we define the api and it Turns out that this is uh, a good fit for the hardware. But even this is not what the hardware deals with. Uh, for that, you have to look at the how this the API. This is in turn uh, OpenGL presents a state machine, which is going to uh, translate everything from this API, which is very which is stateful, to the sort of stateless uh, pieces of hardware. And the doing so efficiently and correctly is uh, surprisingly non-trivial. And uh, it's called job security for those of us that do this for a living. <laughs> um, so this is going to be responsible for taking the shaders and passing it off to a compiler to get the actual hardware code. And instead of having all this state, it's going to be a much more declarative binding interface of all these low level pieces of hardware state. Um, the shaders being one of them, instead of dealing with uh, just uh, vertices, abstract 
abstractly, uh, it's much more concrete buffers, like you just have in C, just a block of memory, uh, except it's GPU memory, and so on and so forth for different parts of the uh, graphic state. And you still have triangles being drawn. That much is going to be a constant for us. For us. On the compiler side, uh, the stack looks like any compiler stack. Uh, if you've look, worked on C compilers for, on the CPU, it's the same idea for the uh, various GPU compilers. But instead of compiling C, we're going to be compiling a much more restricted language. Uh, that's the, the OpenGL shading language, which GLSL. And the reason we do this is that GLSL is um, much simpler, which means it can be implemented more effective to model uh, parts of the hardware graphics hardware that a CPU doesn't have. For example, uh, texturing is not an instruction that uh, a CPU would have, but every GPU would. But the uh, stack itself for the compiler is fairly uh, typical, fairly typical of a compiler. You're parsing the raw source code into an abstract syntax tree. This is not a talk on compilers, so I won't go into the details there, but you're translating that to some intermediate representation. Uh, that is a representation of the program that can be optimized, but is not specific to the hardware. And on other operating systems, uh, generally LLVM is used. Uh, both are free software. But this, the whole point of this is being able to share huge amounts of code between different compilers. Uh, of course, at some point, you have to go back to the hardware. So that uh, optimized NUR or optimized LLVM will be translated to a hardware-specific intermediate representation, which again gets optimized uh, in some hardware-specific fashion. And that gets translated to the final program, which is ready to be run on the uh, machine, as well as uh, generally some amount of metadata about the program that the hardware also needs to execute it. And this is, again, a departure from uh, CPU, where it, machine instructions are just sort of machine instructions in the abstract. Although if you think about the uh, job of a linker and the extra information that's kept in an ELF file versus a raw binary, uh, you see some of the same metadata as well. In parallel to the compiler, you have the driver in the sense of the user space driver, so Mesa, and uh, implementing the graphics API. Yeah. And this is uh, another uh, big drop in abstraction, because no longer are you dealing with these graphics uh, state, or as it's presented to the driver as these constant state objects, uh, which is a, a which can be cached uh, for more efficient processing. Uh, you're dealing with uh, the hardware state itself. And so one of the main respons responsibilities of this user space driver, the OpenGL front end or the Vulkan front end um, into the actual hardware state. And what that looks like is going to be intensely hardware dependent. Um, some depending on how the hardware is structured, that might be commands in terms of, oh, set viewport to these coordinates. It might be registers, write out to this register these coordinates, or uh, all of the viewport state in this one viewport descriptor. And there are examples of all three kinds of GPUs, uh, although it's sort of every GPU has some characteristics of each of these three. Um, the other big responsibility is managing memory allocations. Um, this is familiar to any C programmer having to do malloc and free. Uh, the idea is identical on the GPU, only with way more ways to screw it up, uh, which keeps driver development exciting. <laughs> um, but the concept is the same. And the user space driver just has a memory allocate memory free interface to the kernel. So it's not dealing with that, those minutiae. Uh, 
uh, it's just, just translate uh, allocating memory for the workload, translating the workload and uh, uploading that to the GPU memory. And rest. Uh, this makes up for a significant amount of code, even for the simplest GPU. This slide alone would account for about 10,000 lines of code. And for more complicated, dry, more complicated hardware, uh, that obviously balloons. Uh, but below that is the kernel. And here we see another drop in the abstraction. Now, instead, uh, all you have is the memory management unit itself. Um, if user space says that it wants to allocate uh, 4,000 bytes, it's the kernel's responsibility to go find a page of physical GPU memory and program the page tables to assign it to that user space process and do so in a way that doesn't compromise system security. So a big chunk of kernel driver uh, for a Linux graphics driver is dealing with all of this memory management. Uh, uh, there are common helpers in the kernel for doing this. So uh, you're not reinventing the wheel every time, uh, but this is still a major responsibility. Aside from the memory management, the kernel jobs. Uh, so if multiple, if multiple processes are trying to use the GPU at the same time, uh, generally, a GPU can only execute uh, one piece of work at once, or uh, or maybe two, or maybe three, but certainly a finite number. And it's frequently the kernel driver's responsibility to do that multiplexing. And this is like a CPU in that the CPU scheduler has to multiplex between the pro different processes and with different le priority levels and so on and so forth. And all of the same challenges are going to apply here. Finally, uh, whoever decides what to execute, the kernel is going to tell the hardware to execute this particular uh, set of draw calls or it got from the driver. And that takes you down to the hardware, uh, which is it has itself several layers of abstraction. The uh, but basically, the hardware's front end is going to be parsing whatever hardware state was packed by the user space driver. Uh, whether these were commands or registers or descriptors, it's going to just do whatever it was told by the user space. And the key responsibility of this hardware is going to be uh, executing the by the user space driver. So that would be uh, creating threads for every vertex that's specified and executing the vertex shader and then using triangles and executing the pixel shader. So in that, from that perspective, the hardware looks like just a big CPU. And that is sort of true, but it has, one, it has really two extra tricks that the CPU does not and this is what makes it suitable for graphics. One is that it has a fixed function rasterizer. Given uh, coordinates for a triangle, it has hardware to efficiently uh, de determine what pixels are inside that triangle, uh, which is required to uh, spawn the pixel shaders. And this can be done very efficiently in, in hardware and very inefficiently in software. Um, so this is a major reason why software rasterizers end up being so much slower than using hardware. And then the other thing is that it uh, has its own graphics memory uh, for everything being drawn on screen. So eventually, it's going to write out the results of its, uh, maybe for another GPU, it could go straight to a screen, but those aren't the ones I work with. Um, but before it does that, it can have its own cached copy, which is much more efficient to work with. So this, these two traits uh, enable more efficient uh, rendering compared to what you could do just by uh, making a super supercomputer of different CPUs.
However, uh, executing the shaders themselves look a whole lot like any other computer. You're reading instructions, you're executing them, and things that can't be executed immediately are handled via some sort of message passing interface based on uh, what the hardware is. Um, but they all follow this this pattern. And that's that's your bird, bird's eye view. Uh, probably a little intense. Uh, but if you if you go back and look, uh, there is a natural progression from each stage between the uh, the original application trying to draw something with a particular material, say a reflective glass-like material, like you know, for a mirror, uh, the engine having a high-level uh, shader pressure or this glass type effect, um, the driver compiling that into raw raw code uh, for the hardware, passing it uh, to the hardware in memory, the hardware reading it back, and then running that program for every single pixel covered in your uh, in whatever you're trying to draw, and finally bringing that back to memory. Uh, I guess my point is that there is method to the madness. Uh, I promised I would talk about Vulkan, which is the uh, new uh, hot stuff on the on the block. And the whole promise of Vulkan is that a Vulkan application can have lower overhead than OpenGL application. It's important to qualify this with what kind of over, overhead. And what's actually being talked about is CPU overhead. Uh, the goal of the Vulkan uh, API is to reduce the amount of uh, complexity in the user space driver. So if I go back, uh, Vulkan is only concerned about this slide here. Uh, the, it wants to change the API to get rid of the uh, state in OpenGL and replace it with uh, these constant, significantly more simple, significantly more efficient. Uh, so that's, that's the promise. Everything else remains the same. Uh, and for the most part, and even the, these uh, driver responsibilities don't really disappear. They just get pushed up into the application or the engine instead of being done in the driver hardware much more effectively. Um, a OpenGL driver ends up doing lots of gymnastics internally to make massage OpenGL to look more like Vulkan. So if you're using Vulkan directly, uh, in theory, you can save uh, some complexity in the driver. Of course, that's at the expense of the application. And if anyone here has tried to uh, write a game with Vulkan, you would, you'll would you know that it's a lot harder to work with in OpenGL. Well, there's no surprise. It's not that there are new tasks to solve. It's just that now you're the one solving them instead of uh, whoever wrote the OpenGL driver for you. The other big change with Vulkan is that it gets rid of the uh, GLSL language. And so instead of having this C-like language, it just takes in blobs. Uh, this is not a, this doesn't really make a difference to the application. You can still write GLSL code and uh, translate that to Spurve and give that to the, the, uh, the Vulkan driver. Uh, but it means that the Vulkan driver itself no longer has. Parsing code is very complicated um, for if you want to do it right for a complex language. Um, it has a much larger attack surface than uh, other parts of the stack. Uh, so it's just a nice reduction in complexity and uh, with some the theoretical security benefits uh, to move that to the developers um, of the application's machine as opposed to doing it on the user's device. But that's sort of a minor distinction. Uh, the big selling point of Vulkan is just this lower overhead. Uh, 
the other part that I sort of glossed over here is how these compilers themselves work and how they're structured. And uh, this takes you in into the compiler stack because you have uh, you have a lot of tensions here. On one hand, you want to have uh, nice separations, you know, low level details of instruction scheduling on one particular model of the hardware to have to influence uh, how uh, your compiler's ability to say that uh, x plus x is the same as x times two, right? Uh, the, those are completely unrelated functions. You don't want them to be tied up together. And if you change the hardware's instruction set, just because you have to ch uh, change that scheduler, you don't want to have to change that uh, simple algebraic optimization. So on one hand, you want to split everything up and make everything super abstract. On the other hand, uh, it, there are real optimizations that only make sense on some hardware. Maybe on, maybe on your hardware, uh, doing addition is a lot faster than multiplying by two. So you don't want to make that change. Or maybe it's the other way around. You definitely want to make the other, the opposite change. Um, so that's a tension there. And similarly, you don't want to have to rewrite uh, the compiler for every single piece of hardware. It, uh, if we were in a proprietary world, we would do that and nobody would bat an eye because you have infinite amounts of money to throw it in and no desire to share with your competitors. But this is open source. And ideally, uh, we would have one common piece of compiler infrastructure that every open source compiler can use. Uh, and the result of this is uh, that we need to have some sort of stack. And so the compiler stack, again, it's turtles all the way down. Um, just for a taste of what this is going to look like for Panfrost, uh, which is the main dri uh, driver I work on, uh, the, it ha has a few different code paths depending on what API it's using. So for OpenGL, you have these simplest code path. Uh, and for Vulkan, same thing. You have your GLSL or you have your Spurvy. Uh, there is common code in Mesa to uh, form. There's common code to translate Spurvy into, the, into NUR. And then the only code that my team has to write is a compiler to go from NUR code into the uh, Molly hardware. And that's it. And that's uh, doing that is still a, a substantial amount of work. Uh, but to do the uh, GLSL, the GLSL compiling and all of the common optimizations that are done in NUR, we get essentially for free. So it's a nice win for open source. Uh, OpenCL is not quite so nice in Mesa. And the problem with OpenCL, well, I told you that you don't run C code on a GPU. You run a much simpler language, GLSL. Uh, unfortunately, that's not true anymore once you get to OpenCL, uh, where you run OpenCLC, which also OpenCLC++. I'll leave that one to your imagination. <laughs> uh, so I'll, Although a lot of us in Mesa are fairly crazy, we are not, in fact, crazy enough to write our own uh, C and C++ compilers from scratch. Uh, so Mesa relies on Clang, uh, which is the open source C and C++ compiler. And instead of having Clang target the GPU directly, we just have it go, uh, output its intermediate LLVM code. And there is a, another library uh, that can translate from LLVM into Spurvy. And then from there, we can use the same code path that we used on Vulkan. So there's a lot of hops in between. Uh, and it looks a little ugly, but it's not, it's not an issue for the efficiency of the compiler for the most part. Uh, and this allows, uh, if you were right, to avoid duplicating effort in silly places. Uh, certainly on one extreme, it makes no sense for pan for us to have to know how to uh, parse C code in order to implement OpenCL. On the other hand, uh, it doesn't make any sense for Clang to know how to output uh, Molly code directly. Uh, so we have the layering. Uh, 
and it's hard to get totally right, but uh, I like to think we're getting close. So when you put it all together, the pound for us compiler stack uh, looks like this. And the nice thing here is that everything to the left of the pound for us circle is completely standard Mesa code that every driver in Mesa is able to share if they so choose. So when you look at it like this, I mean, yeah, there are a lot of uh, there are a lot of moving parts here, but it's nothing that you can't keep all in your head. Uh, I don't know if I want to scare you with this, but I did also make a diagram of all of the different code paths for Mesa's compilers. Uh, I don't feel the need to explain this in detail, but uh, this was the best I could do. There is a similar chart on Wikipedia, but it's a few years old, so they're missing a bunch of uh, horrifying code paths that have since been added. Uh, I don't think this is complete, but this should get all the big front ends because, yeah, there are um, multiple, in addition to OpenGL, OpenCL, and Vulkan, there's also a DirectX 9 front end in Mesa. Uh, there are several other intermediate representations used in Mesa that I didn't tell you about uh, because they're uh, legacy at this point. There are uh, legacy ways to input programs into OpenGL that are not GLSL, so those have their own crazy code paths. And uh, depending on what driver you're using, there are much more convoluted paths to the hardware uh, than just going straight through NUR. For example, uh, the a uh, AMD driver, uh, Radian S SI, translates from NUR into LLVM, and then their actual compiler is part of LLVM as opposed to part of Mesa. And so that's a much more complex stack. Uh, but that's the big picture, at least. Um, this is the little picture that I try to think about. This is the big picture, which uh, I regretted typing up as soon as I finished. Uh, that's all I have prepared for now, so thank you. Um, I hope with that, you at least have the high level picture in your head of all the different moving parts. And uh, I would love to answer some questions or talk more about uh, particular pieces that are more interesting because I, I know I covered a lot, but uh, this was all very high level and uh, very fast. So uh, yeah, happy to answer questions. Thank you.